Savior. So let me give it to you as I've written it out the best I can. I'm now over 50 years old. But I have no hesitation to tell you that my daddy is, is, was, and always has been my hero. Whether it was years of difficulty or not, he was bigger than life. My dad was pretty much the focus of my life, and he was bigger than life. It really is understandable because Dad and I practically grew up together. Uh, he's only 17 years older than me. I also, sometimes I tell him I think we went through adolescence about the same time. <laughs> he, uh, I don't know many of you can say that you got to see your dad uh, graduate from high school, play in the Shrine Bowl, see him play his senior year in high school football. And uh, let me just give you a few words before I speak about the text here. Those uh, few words is, would be simply this. My dad and I, in many ways, many ways, did grow up together. But as I was growing up in school, uh, every class I went to, now y'all got to understand, Charlotte was different back then. I was a pretty good while ago. It was small, a lot smaller. It was uh, a lot different, a lot quieter. Not as famous. And I knew pretty much in every classroom that I went through, through the parents of my schoolmates, my dad was famous. Everybody knew him in Charlotte. And I knew my mother would be the best looking classmate. She would walk in. I know in fifth grade she walked in. She's, uh, what, 27 years old? Nobody had a 27 year old mama walk in. <laughs> still see Mike Simpson uh, say, that ain't your mom. <laughs> I was always proud, no matter where I went, to tell people who my dad was. And I was always proud because he would say, it's my boy. This is my son. This is my son. Memorial Stadium, we always do the ticket taker, we got it pretty cheap. <laughs> Charlotte Coliseum, how many times did Ray Smith let us in the side of the turnstile? And so I'll owe that to your daddy. And he said, well, here's my boy, here's my son, did he come in? Oh yeah, y'all just go hold the rope, I'll hire you for the night. <laughs> he was my father. What a father. Uh, let me see if I can give you, I don't, I don't want to give you all the story, but I just want to give you three quick things, three quick statements about being a father. Fifth grade, Midwood High School, Midwood uh, Frank School. You know, the, the kid with the glasses that always got to work in the office, I forgot who her name was. But she came up and knocked on the door and said, um, Ike Reader needs to come to the office. Well, I, that was a pretty regular occurrence for me. <laughs> I didn't think much of it until I got down there and I walked around and I'll never forget looking and there was my dad sitting in the principal. I figured I was dead. <laughs> he was going to shoot me with a bazooka or something. My dad taught me about parenting that day. Sure, go to the sandbox and get in with the kids. And go throw the baseball with them and get all that. That day, Daddy put me in the car. He drove nine hours to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I got to go with him when he was umpiring that. I got to go through two stands. And I got to go into my daddy's life. My daddy always took me to his life. Umpiring, baseball, general manager, selling. He taught me that you raise a son by taking him where you walk, stand up, and lie down. Way you live your life. And that's what I got to learn. I got to go with the life. That was a great, one of the greatest moments in my life was to get dismissed from school, get the car, go with my dad, sit in that stadium. And I made the stupid mistake of telling everybody in Chattanooga in that ballpark, my dad is the umpire. <laughs> Son, I turned around and you were yelling at me worse than anything. <laughs> you know, 
only did it for self-protection. <laughs> I remember also when I, uh, when I was 15, my rebellious years were coming pretty hard, pretty quickly. My dad was gone six and seven months out of the year in baseball, coming back every weekend when he could. No plane travel for minor league umpires. We got together as much as we could, but that meant a real burden on mother, and I became a real burden on mother. A pretty big boy, she had her hands full. My dad came home that day, and uh, one day, and she had a whole list of things that he was to spank me for. <laughs> so we went upstairs, and my dad's favorite play was, son, you go get the belt. My dad had two belts. One was a big, thick one, and another was a small flimsy. Have you ever just gone and got the rope, you're going to get yourself on with it? <laughs> I got the big, thick one. You just signed in your own death warrant. Now, folks, I don't, I'm sure some of you have read the books that you're not supposed to do this, but he did it. And uh, he didn't read uh, Mr. Spock. He had another uh, another way to raise me. And if I got the small flimsy one, I'd make him mad, and he'd have to go get the big one. <laughs> that day set me down. My mother was particularly upset over the list of things that I had done to cause trouble. But he looked at me. He taught me a real big lesson about self-centeredness. He looked at me and said, son, I met your mama when I was 15. I love her. And this is getting tiring. And you're causing her a lot of problems. I love you. If you make me decide between you and her, you're out of here. I've called Jackson Reformatory School. They got a place for you. <laughs> you know that, uh, I don't know how, how that fits in the parenting books, but <laughs> he, uh, he didn't have any more problems with me uh, to speak of. I found out I wasn't the center of that home. And that made uh, a lot of sense to me. I'll tell you one other story. My, my mom and dad would also always get us together and we would go up to the mountains for a day for a picnic. We were standing beside the stream and it was just right before we moved back to the morning. It was me and Vicky and dad and mom. This mountain stream was looked wide to me as 10 years old. They said, go on the other side. Go across those rocks. I got a little bit halfway and I came back. I said, Daddy, I can't do it. You finished eating it. Daddy went across the rocks. I looked at my mom and I said, Oh, what is he doing? He said, Son, he's telling you to quit saying you can't do it. I crossed the rocks. That was a big moment in my life. He didn't get on me for not knowing, he just showed me. He could do it. Well, I'm going to stop. Uh, let me just tell you also, this man that I want to tell you about, I always tell people I got saved out of a drug problem. My dead mom drug me to church every Sunday. <laughs> uh, my dad taught me to respect, love, and honor authority figures. He taught me to do so, to love my father and my mother. The way he taught me was by his own devotion to his dead mom, by the devotion he insisted to my mother's dead mom. My dad loved his country. He was proud of serving in the Marine Corps. Served between World War II and the Korean War. He always told me he fought and won the battle of Camp Street. And he uh, My dad uh, stood beside me at Whiting Avenue Baptist Church on January 26, 1969. He said that word son that I'd love to hear him say it again. <coughs> and uh, he said, are you nervous? They were playing, the, I was about to go out, I was about to get married at 20 years of age. He said, are you nervous? And I said, uh, no, Dad, I'm not nervous. I turned my hand over, water was pouring. <laughs> he said, son, you made a good choice. He said, you love her. She's going to love you. You make sure she keeps the check on her. <laughs> Great piece of advice. You know, uh, I just want to tell you, my dad was the smartest man I know. I'm not saying it because of the people. If you'd asked me two weeks ago, I told you. He's the smartest man I know. He knew more about life, he knew more about people than anybody I had ever talked to. My dad had an opinion on everything. He felt you deserved to hear it. <laughs> and I want to 
tell you something that he almost always was right. Sometimes I didn't think so, but I found out later. And he believed that a man ought to be a man, and a man lets people know who he is, and he doesn't play games. He doesn't put on facades. My dad loved to live life. He loved to live life. He loved to live it to its fullest. And he all told me, when you give your word, keep your word. He's my dad. He's my hero. He's my best friend. Now, if I can just let me give you a minute here, I want to tell you about my dad and my many of you here are sinners. The text I read for you was Luke 16. And Luke 15 is the parable of the prodigal son. I'd like you to just remember four phrases from it. It says that the prodigal, as a young son at home, was a blessed man. Then it says he went to a distant land. Then it said he came to his senses. Then it said he came home. My dad was a blessed man. Harry Lloyd Reader Jr. was born to Harry Lloyd Reader Sr. and Annie Lewis Reader, two wonderful people. My dad's dad was one of nine children, four generations in Augusta, Georgia. He was a blessed man. I will tell you about somebody nobody's told you about yet. His man, Lizzie, his grandma, his dad's mom. She used to get on the, she'd get on the, uh, on her knees. And she'd say, Harry Jr. Come here. She couldn't read. Harry Jr. would be brought in at eight years of age to read the Bible to her. And then she'd start praying for everybody. He said, oh, son, she'd start praying, and I knew we were going to be there for hours. <laughs> That's the truth. An eight-year-old boy reading the Bible there for hours. Then God began to take those prayers of Mammy. Those nine kids all came to Christ. Those nine kids all came to Christ, and one of them was his dad, Harry Reader Sr. Through baseball, he left Augusta, came up to Charlotte. He lived here as part of a great church, Calvary Church, with his two brothers, Lonnie and Otis. They loved Charlotte. Dad, of course, ended up here in Harding High School, loved to play sports, met Mom. They were married, just very quickly. He finally, is, he, uh, his freshman year, his uh, sophomore year, he worked his way up to being the starting tackle. The war was over. And that day, five Harding High School students who had gone and fought that war came back to finish as they walked over the hill to the football practice. Daddy looked at them and realized he wasn't going to be able to compete with men. So they walked down and picked up their uniforms, and he went up over the hill. There were two or three guys here today and joined the Marine Corps at 16 years of age. He married my mom there. I was born and came back and finished Harding High School. He then sold life insurance. They went into baseball. He was a blessed man. We moved back to Charlotte after traveling around in minor league baseball. When we got back here, he took me to the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. There he started their first evangelistic visitation. There he taught my Sunday school class. <coughs> Ten-year-old boys. That's what the T-Tech class. But we did not move in that class. We sat there and he listened. <laughs> He taught my Sunday school class, and then he went back into baseball and went with St. Louis Cardinals and Pittsburgh Pirates. And, and then uh, this blessed man began to drip. They used work as an excuse. And we weren't at church on Wednesday night. But it never starts with the obvious. And then it was Sunday night. And then it was back row. And then there was just always an excuse not to. I was off in rebellion, and at the same time, my dad, the blessed man, the son, took what he had been blessed with, and he went to a distant land. He lived in that distant land for 15 years. It was a land of self-centeredness and sin. It was a land that seared his conscience. It was a land that brought nothing but despair to him. It was a land of famine. He had no real substance. And that third place I gave him, he came to his senses. <coughs> Boy, 
Lord used a number of things, not the least of which was his father's death in 1990. He was a blessed man. He went to a distant country, came to his senses, and became home. And it was a welcoming home. There weren't any elder brothers looking down on him. It was a welcoming home. We were grateful to see him. It wasn't only the death of a father that brought him home, it was the love of a woman, three girls, who never would lose contact, no matter how far he tried to go away from that distant land. But most of all, it was the war. The prodigal came home in 1990, first to his home and then to the home of his heavenly father. I got the chance to rebury my dad. I, I prayed the whole night before, what am I going to say? I just said, Daddy, you take Mom to be your wife. <laughs> <laughs> then I became my dad's pastor for almost 10 years. I got to watch him deal with the demons of the past, watch his spiritual growth, watch his development. It just kept going. With great joy, entered into the church plant out in Monroe. He really enjoyed it. Helps my dad's in small groups with Bible studies and prayer. And uh, he was my counselor from afar now as I was in Birmingham and I'd call him and ask him questions. When he came home, he started reading his Bible. He used to go through it. Where it's all colored up, marked up, printed up, notes beside it. And he finally got through it about three times in his last 10 years. He loved Romans 8, 28, and he read of the love of Christ, that you can't be separated from the love of Christ. This is what he said in the He said, God's love is so great. Jesus must love me so much because I've been so bad. Isn't God's grace good? He loved Revelation. Written beside the text that was read, he wrote, Jesus paid it. He really got into the outreach ministry with Joe Gibbs in his last six months. He was inviting as many people as he could come out there where Joe would share his testimony so they could hear it. He told me, he said, son, he called him the point, he said, son, he does it right. He tells him the truth, he tells him honest, and he tells him the truth that Jesus loves him. And he said, uh, this is the, he'd say it a whole lot better than me, so I'm just telling him I want him to hear it. I want him to come out there with me. Some of you have got invitations sitting here today, he's supposed to go with him to the next one. And he's not here to take you, but go on. Say the message. Say the message. We'll love to hear it. Well, I, let me just revert for a moment now to the pastor's role. I was a pastor up here. Girls, sisters, dad's daughters. He was so proud. He was proud of you. You meant everything. Charlie, Amy, I'm Charlie. Well, I pray for us the way I do it. Charlie, Amy. Charlie, Robert, Calvin, Sidney. Y'all were not in laws. Y'all were like his children. Thank you for treating them like you did. <coughs> the grandchildren, he loved you and you are his legacy. Learn your lessons well. Love your own daddies while you got them. And hear the stories of what God has done in the past because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. For all the family that's here, you don't know how much he loved his family. He has uh, instilled in us a love and appreciation for all of you, and all of you have lived up to everything that he would say to you. You are the love of his life. As a son and as a pastor, what I tell you is this. Many women have done well, but you have been self -denied. For me, I got one disappointment. I can't tell you. I break my God went to 
but I took my daddy home from the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> and he was having a good round. <laughs> and I'm so grateful he took him quick. He did not, he just loved life too much. He could not have taken it anymore. But I do have a disappointment. I have always prayed the Lord just took out my hands, both my granddaddy and my daddy. I always prayed that I would be able to be there so that I could tell them what I try to tell them every time I talk to them. I love you. And thank you. That's probably what I wanted to say more than anything is, uh, is thanks, Daddy. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. I'll just finish it this way. If I could have been there, I'd said this. I think, uh, before I tell you this, though, let me just say one thing. <laughs> Folks, my dad was saved by God's grace. That's all. <clears throat> he would be here to tell you, in fact, probably what we're going to put on the market. That's what he insisted on every time we talked to us. He lies a poor sinner saved by a person. My daddy would want you to meet me up there. If you want to talk to somebody, you talk to me. I'll talk to you about it. I've got it. I've been able to do it. But I'd love to tell you about the same Savior who can save you from your sins. But I'll finish with this. Dad, I love you. If I could have been there, last thing I would have said is thanks, Daddy. You were my coach. You were my best friend. You were my father. And I had never, never wanted to know. You understood me better than I understood myself. You taught me that as a son, there are great privileges. There's also responsibilities. Thanks, Dave. You were my dad. Thanks for making me proud of you. Thanks for calling me your son. Thanks for giving me mama and my sisters. Thanks, Dad, for teaching me how to hit a baseball, how to shoot a basketball. You wouldn't let me run with you, so you taught me how to tackle people with a football. Thanks for the joy of an afternoon on a golf course with my baby.
saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, now I'm found. Why? Now I see. Thanks, Lord.
again. We want to thank all of you for being here. Don't know when we get to see you again here or not. I was with my daddy last weekend. Thought we were going to be together next weekend, but Lord had other plans. You know not what hour the Lord will require your soul. It's the Lord that gives life, the Lord that takes away life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You ready? You know it? Can't work your way to heaven. Can't depend on your righteousness. It's like filthy rags. Repent of your sin, repent of your righteousness, and receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And if I don't see you here, the dead, I'll see you there. Before the throne. Because either way, the truth and the life. No man can come to the Father, but through him. See you later, Dad. Grace, mercy, and peace, now and forevermore. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, this has been a, um, an effort of love, love to dead, love to the Lord, and now love to you as we've shared this video with you. Grace, mercy, and peace because of Jesus Christ be unto you. We thank the Lord for what he has done in the life of our father and my mom's husband. We thank the Lord for what he has done through a man in the lives of so many, and it will keep reverberating for a long time. I would close simply this way. 
Uh, those of you that are looking at this, are you ready uh, for heaven? Are you ready to appear before the Lord? There's only one way you can stand in that day. If you're standing in your record, you'll be cast away. But if you're standing in Jesus Christ, you can have eternal life. Let me ask you a question. Not only are you ready, are you enjoying the Lord on your way to heaven, living for Him, growing in grace, declaring His mercy and His uh, righteousness because of what He has done for His people? And do you know Him personally as your Lord and Savior? Let me ask you another question. As you head to heaven, you taking anybody with you? Why don't you take some more with you? It's great to finish strong, and it is so glorious to come across that line, holding hands with others that the Lord has used you to bring there. We thank the Lord for Dad, and Dad, thanks for bringing us to the finish line too. Uh, enjoy the Savior. We'll see you soon. And may the Lord bless you. By the gospel of grace, it will set you free.